I think it is a very significant announcement in the sense that uh, President Che is committing to multilateralism, to working with other countries to address the climate crisis. Uh, clearly, he signals some direction of travel, but not a lot of specifics in his statement. It matters tremendously uh, how early China peaks its emissions and how rapidly it comes down after that. Uh, I think the most significant thing in there was the commitment to achieving carbon neutrality no later than 2060. That's the first time China has indicated that. That is very significant. But I think geopolitically, it also indicates that China is throwing its lot in with the European Union and others that want to be leaders on climate and put the U.S. in a bit of a bind, actually. Uh, it's not clear it'll have any impact on President Trump. He seems impervious uh, to these kind of uh, issues. Um, but certainly, uh, if you had a Biden administration coming in next year, it would put some pressure on the U.S. Uh, to catch up uh, and uh, re-enter, not only re-enter Paris, but fo put forward a 2030 target for the United States fairly early on in the administration. It's a very comprehensive plan. I would encourage all of you to take a look at it on their website. It's very detailed. Um, the headlines are that he commits to get the U.S. to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, no later than 2050, and he proposes to decarbonize the U.S. electricity sector by 2035. Of course, electricity is the sector that's been going faster than any other in the U.S. because of the uncompetitive nature of coal in our economy, due not only to natural gas, but to efficiency and renewables such as wind and solar, which have come down dramatically in price and now are more competitive uh, with coal and gas. Um, he does talk about uh, stopping uh, fracking of natural gas on public lands. Uh, he has made clear he is not going to ban uh, fracking on private lands, which is where the majority of our fracked gas now comes from. Um, but clearly, if you're going to get to net zero total emissions by mid-century, you either need to come up with a way to uh, capture and sequester carbon from natural gas use in the power sector or buildings, or uh, you need to phase out gas. Um, and I think that's going to be a very interesting discussion, actually, in coming years. We need the federal government in the game to achieve the, the long-term objectives of Paris. Certainly getting below two degrees Celsius and any chance of approaching 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature limitation goals. But as you mentioned, there's a very powerful movement which actually started uh, just after Donald Trump's election. I was in Marrakesh at the climate summit in 2016 when we got the unexpected news that Donald Trump had been elected president. And the very next day, we started organizing statements and letters from governors, from mayors, from business leaders and others assuring the world that the United States was not just the federal government and that the United States would do everything it could to meet the Paris objectives. Uh, that movement is now called We Are Still In. It's grown to include 25 states, hundreds of cities, thousands of businesses, investors, and universities. And collectively, it represents over half of the U.S. population and more than two-thirds of the U.S. economy. So it's a very significant movement. And it is uh, driving dramatic changes at the state level. For example, there are now 16 states that have committed to get to 100% uh, clean energy at various dates between now and, and 2050. Uh, and in our system of government, actually, a lot of, of energy and transportation policy is driven by the states and regions, not by Washington. So there's a lot that the states and regions can do. So I think, uh, I think that We Are Still In movement would expand uh, and add more members under a second Trump uh, term, uh, would continue to push for decarbonizing the U.S. economy. Uh, it would be challenging for the U.S. to meet its 2025 Paris reduction target of 26 to 28 percent without the federal government engaged, uh, but we would continue reducing emissions. It's actually mixed. Um, it's true that since 2007, 2008, when you famously had Newt Gingrich, the former Republican Speaker of the House, and Nancy Pelosi, the current Dem Democratic Speaker of the House, jointly sitting on a couch uh, talking about how climate was an essential issue and we all have to address it, the Republican Party has not uh, shown leadership over the last decade. The interesting thing, though, is Republican voters, even though there is some difference between Democrats and Republicans, 
Republicans, by a, a strong majority, believe climate change is an issue we should address. And even stronger majorities support solutions to climate change, such as electric vehicles, energy efficient buildings, uh, solar energy and wind generation. Clean energy is amazingly popular among voter, American voters of all political persuasions. And so that's the good news. People want the solutions to the problem. There's no prospect the president's gonna Trump is gonna change before the election. I mean, if you look at the speech he gave in California last week and he went out there to look at the wildfires where he uh, said that the science doesn't know and predicted that climate change would miraculously reverse and we would start to get cooler. I don't expect any change from him in, in the next several weeks. Uh, whether if in, he was elected to a second term there would be any changes is an interesting question because there are elements of the Republican Party such, such as the minority leader in the House, Kevin McCarthy, who understand that especially for younger voters, millennials, independents, women, Hispanics, African Americans, others, uh, this is a very important issue to them. And the Republican Party risks being on the wrong side of history if it continues to have its ostrich head in the sand approach to deny the problem is even real. Um, so there you, you could see some interesting things happen within the broader Republican Party. Whether that would be enough to shift Donald Trump's position is hard to believe, given how, how, how strongly he has made statements about Paris and about climate science and other things. But I think on issues like clean energy, you might see some evolution. You might see some more willingness to provide incentives for clean energy uh, technology, not at the expense of oil and coal and gas. He's clearly very committed to his supporters in the fossil fuel industry. The interesting thing there is especially he committed to coal in the 2016 campaign and since, but all the trends have shown coal use continuing to go down even at a faster rate than it is during the Obama presidency because of economic factors, because of the uncompetitiveness of coal in the market compared to natural gas and renewables. There's very, very little Donald Trump can do to, to reverse economic trends that were very powerful economic trends in the electric sector, for example. So I think you could see some changes around the margin in his policy, but um, him totally flip-flopping and saying he gets it now, climate change is real and it's a crisis and we need to take action, that's just hard to imagine given where he is now.